Good evening. Am I audible? Let me do something. Good evening. I'm just waiting for people to trickle in. We'll soon start the meeting. I see people are trickling. For those who have just tuned in, I want to thank you. Go I want to thank you for being so early. You even switched your you went in before I could go in. When I see it here, the numbers are racing. In that way, I'm very happy in this Women's Month to once more be with you in one of our monthly female education webinars. The webinars of today, we send it all to all participants who are here. And uh, we are really, this month, we want to dedicate this to all women of South Africa, to all the women of the world. This is a webinar on contraception. You might think that uh, this webinar is not relevant to you, but your mothers and fathers, As mothers and fathers, you really need to know about this so that you can be able to talk to your children at home. I'm going to again. So that you can know about the contraception. The rationale for this webinar, you will see it as time goes on, that is not only an academic exercise, but it's a public health endeavor to address the plague that befall your All the women and children of South Africa, more especially the people with dark colors. I'm a dark colored person. So I really think the dark colored people should do some introspection and see whether among the gains that they gained after liberation, the issue of contraception, are they taking it very serious? If not, really, we need to introspect and see whether shouldn't we change the way we approach the way we rear the girl child, because contraception is very important for both boys and girls. But girls who are future women are the ones that get more affected by a lack of contraception. So ladies and gentlemen, I think we have reached a quota. But before we could start, this webinar of today, which is on contraception. Let me introduce myself as Dr. D.T. Mahapa. I'm very much known to some of you. I'm a urogynecologist here in Limpopo, practicing here in Limpopo. So before we welcome this, we start, let's welcome the women 
Come on. This is the welcome that we need to welcome women to this.
Kalale sai sai buruku ba mona muhuru buta mo atasi sone. How na karuwa ka? Ai. We have celebrated women of this world. Welcome, everybody. I wonder whether my picture is visible there because this side of mine, I'm blurry. But anyway, let's go on. I welcome you all to this webinar on contraception on Women Month. In the first place, we ask ourselves a question on this Women's Month. Are all women playing their part in the care of the girl child? Because the girl child is the future woman. We should care more about the future woman than the present woman. Men have got limited ability and chance to discuss contraceptives with girls. Just imagine a situation where a man is a stepfather and he has to discuss contraception with a stepdaughter. Definitely, it won't go well with the mother. Even these days, even if he's not a stepfather, the real biological father, if he starts talking contraception with a girl, the mother will feel suspicious. But the mother is not taking that role. Are women taking part in discussing contraception with their children? You know, in Africa, before we become colonized, not only physically colonized, but mentally colonized, there was no high level of anti unintended pregnancies. Teenage pregnancy was not talked of. It was a taboo. The things like child neglect, infanticide, you wouldn't hear about it. You wouldn't hear of such because girl child was introduced. I don't know what's wrong. My picture is not visible. I don't know what's wrong with it. The girl child was introduced to good manners, good manners and good attitude towards womanhood. The girl child would not just do as he wish, like now we see. So we women, we must wake up and try to reinvent those values that were there in an African child. Abortion was a taboo, and it's still a taboo even now, but we use it as a contraceptive method. Why should we use abortion? I worked in more than two academic centers, and in all of them, the biggest clinic is abortion clinic. And the state cares for the abortion clinic. Eh? All other clinics can rather be short staff. You rather have something short in theater or in ICU. But abortion clinic will have all equipments. If abortion can have no equipment, ooh, which means the state, we are prioritizing abortion more than other important health seeking uh, health important areas of the hospital where people need real help where are those structure schools that old women used to take girls to and teach them womanhood school of men still exists Every year, the, the only Maria and we see they are talking about them. The, the chiefs are looking out at them. Where do you teach girls real manners of womanhood? Where women were taught how to cook, where women were taught things like menstruation, how to behave themselves. We have a year where sex education was taught. Where are they? Do we ever to discuss this with our children? If not, why can't we start and re resurrect those structured schools? I call them schools. Are we waiting for men to say, 
They must do it for us. Nobody can do it for you. In this world, everybody for himself and God for us all. Women have got the tendency of saying when everything goes bad with them, they say, man, man, man. Women, this one, I'm challenging you to wake up and do what is right for you. This aim of this webinar is actually a public awareness on the importance of contraceptives. There are a lot of other issues that women need to address, but I chose contraceptive. And I want to realign the gender role because there's this issue of saying the in South Africa gender role are bled. They'll say this is for all. There's nothing for men. There's nothing for women. There is something for women. There's something for men. Woman to woman, men to men. A woman must look after the welfare of the girl child and teach the child and prepare the child for a meaningful womanhood. So must the men do. And men, men, we haven't relegated our duties. We do that. Are we women? I'm not saying you have relegated. I'm asking a question. Are you having to relegate those duties to men or just left the girls to learn womanhood by trial and error? There are some terms that are used loosely in South Africa. The term gender equality and the term gender equity. Gender equality, by definition, it means the rights and responsibility and opportunities of an individual will not depend on whether they are male or female. Yes, the rights and responsibility. Nobody can dispute that. Whether it's male or female, or it's handicapped or able-bodied or young or old, or white or black, or rural or, or urban setting. This is, nobody can dispute that. But are all rights of men are rights of women? Are all rights of women, responsibilities of men, rights of women? If in the morning you wake up, you and your wife, or you and your husband, you find that your wife's car has got a puncture. Who is likely to be late at work fixing the puncture? Probably the wife will take the husband's car and the husband will remain fixing the, the, the tire. That's the responsibility of the husband. There's no things that, that say there's equality. A woman and a man are not equal. I'm not saying one is higher than who. There are other rights and other responsibilities and opportunity that are for women. And there are other rights and responsibility and opportunities that are for men. That must be clearly defined. This thing of mixing them and mixing gender equality with gender equity is what I think is driving this world crazy. Gender equity is defined by European Institute of Gender Equity as the provision of fairness and justice in the distribution of benefits and responsibility. Of course, the benefits and responsibility must be fairly distributed. You can't take the benefits and responsibility of a woman and give them to a man and vice versa. That is gender equity. So I think from now on, when you talk, we must never talk about gender equality. Gender, there's no thing called gender equality. Even biologically, men and women are different. Even genetically, a female has got 46 XX, a woman has got 46 SY. Even phenotypically, they differ. So there's no gender equality. It's gender equity. And this gender equity has tend to be, they think it's synonymous to gender equality. So from now onwards, let's talk about gender equality. Like for example, breastfeeding is a responsibility of a woman. A man has got no breast to breastfeed a baby. And if a child is hungry, it's a responsibility of a woman. I'm not denying the fact that there are areas where we need to come together and do things to Africa, South Africa is not part of Africa, I think. If in Africa women have not lost their role in teaching girls. In Kigali, in Rwanda. On the streets of Kigali, we talk about Gukuna because this woman, there is a lot. And Tativa is took took things upon himself to educate women girl children and teach them what is supposed to be known they need to learn 
I am here to help young girls with various problems. Dativa, or anti-Dativa, thinks problems in the bedroom, sexual frustration and divorce plague Rwanda's modern urban society because mothers and aunties no longer have the time to teach their daughters traditional values. So she's taken matters into her own hands. She runs Gokuna workshops for young women and girls who each pay her 150 euros. This woman he gathers women, young girls, and teach them things that a woman, every woman need to know. I think I'm challenging the South African women that we should see such things where girls during winter, they say we're going to so and so, we're going to tell about, we're going to learn about womanhood. So is contraception. The word contraception means against conception. <clears throat> when you say something is contrary to something, it means against that. That's why contraception comes from the word against conception. Is the method that prevent women to fall pregnant. It prevent pregnancy, more especially unwanted pregnancy. The motivation for this webinar was done by the fact that there's a lot of ignorance and lack of knowledge about contraceptives among the teens, people who need to use contraception. I'm aware that some of you here don't need to use it, but Lack of education on contraception and family planning is what is responsible for this high rate of abortion, high rate of teenage pregnancy, high rate of a child headed family, high rate of single mothers. And nowadays, children tend to use abortion as a contraceptive method. And that, it, it, it really bothers me a lot because well, when I see, I worked in two academic hospitals, very big academic hospitals, and the abortion clinics there are full. There are people whose only method of preventing to fall pregnant, to take pregnancy to term is abortion. I think if we leave it like that, more than a sizable percentage of our girls, by the time they get married and mature enough, they will have undergone two, three, four abortions. And abortions got its own side effect. They will suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Just imagine if you have done three, four abortions and we get pelvic infection, the tubes get blocked. And when you are an adult, you can't have children. That will send you to psychiatric hospital because you will regret a lot. And most people who undergo abortion, they don't get thoroughly clean. They get subclinical infection, and later they get salpingitis with tubal block. Ultimately, they are unable to make, have children, and they always remember those children that they have aborted. So we must try to minimize the rate of abortion. I'm not saying they cannot be unintended pregnancy, but we must minimize them. A challenge of women to come forward is innovative methods to combat this rate of abortion and come with proper acceptable methods of preventing pregnancy. We'll discuss different methods, but you'll think, what do I? I don't want to be a dictator. The, why we need contraception is because we want to avoid unwanted pregnancy, not unplanned pregnancy. I'm not saying unplanned, unwanted, because visually there's no plan. There's nothing myth that they say there's a planned pregnancy. Very few pregnancies are planned. Families are running with four or five children. None of the pregnancies have been planned. So I, unwanted pregnancy. In, in those stable couples, to regulate the interval between pregnancies, the timing of pregnancy, so that children must, they mustn't be too close or they mustn't be too far. You can use contraception to, to achieve that aim. And what kind of contraception should you use? Is there a something called ideal contraception? The contraception that has got no side effects, that is 100% effective, that is acceptable, that can be reversed at willy-nilly, that is inexpensive, is affordable, that is long-lasting, can last as much as you want, that requires no little medical supervision. There's no contraception that satisfies this criteria. Every contraception has got some side effects, has got a limited ability of effectivity, because when I say limited ability of effectivity, meant even if you use contraception, there are still those little chances that the contraception may fail and you'll fall pregnant. So not all contraception are acceptable to everybody. We'll see when you come to side effect thereafter. 
And some of the contraceptions are not reversible, like sterilization. And some are really expensive, must be the good one. And every contraception, except the long lasting ones, they've got a limited time. So there's nothing called ideal contraceptions. You can't rely on contraception because it might fail, you know. Although I've got different types of contraception, ranging from the depo provera, which is injectable, up to a, a loop, up to diaphragm and condom. Each one has got its own effectivity and failure rate. So the common methods of contraceptions are this. There are those that were used for spacing. As I said, contraception are for family spacing. Those are the barrier methods. Barrier methods are contraceptions like the diaphragm, condom, spermicides, and so on. And the intrauterine contraceptive devices. That's for family spacing. You put a device today, a loop, when you think now my child is old enough, I need another baby. You want another baby, you can remove it. And hormonal method, which are mostly are given as tablets or as injectable. Because even emergency contraception is for family for spacing. There are terminal methods that are said to be irreversible. Although with science now and technology, uh, there's some reversibility, but success rate is so poor that I classify them as irreversible because the success rate of reversal of male sterilization or female sterilization is so low. So if somebody decides to do sterilization, you must be sure, sure that you're not going to ask for reversal. These are the different types. There are more than this. We start with a condom which is a male condom, which is commonest. It is even found everywhere. You know, it, it surprised me. The, the government spent so much money on condoms that they displace them everywhere. You go to hospitals, you find them, you can just pick them on the corridor. You go to government building, you find condoms. Now, I hear that they are even there at school. My question is, did the Angus school Why? It's for LO. If you've got something as a teaching aid at school, you must do practicals. Are they doing practicals? Do they just teach them how to do that? How will you teach them? They are not wanted at school. Because at school, you must teach them not to engage in sex. And the female condom, we have got oral contraceptives, which are common to everybody. There is a contraceptive ring. There is a loop which can be medicated or not medicated, and injections, which are different types of injection, and the surgical method, which I said, the sterilization terminal method. And nowadays there are implants, and some people use rhythm method and calendar method. Some people use douches, post coital douches, and some people use post, uh, contraceptive patches and diaphragm. There are different methods of contraception, and people should be educated on how to use them. Let's start with the barrier methods. The commonest barrier method is condom. The male condom is known to everybody. The female condom is not so popular. But actually, who is must use contraception? It's a female. Why is the contraceptive which is so popular being a male one? While actually it's the woman who must prevent pregnancy. It should have been vice versa. Because if it's a male condom that is... Uh, Popular. It means it's at, the woman is at the, at the mercy of a man not to fall pregnant or not. While if the woman can take control of her fertility, she should use the female condom. Female condom should be the one that she should have or the cervical cap. So the male condom is the commonest one. A female condom is there, but it's not commonly used. And I think women should learn how to use it. And we Bridge it up. The diaphragm also is there, but not so commonly used. And spermicides. Spermicides, I think most people use it as a post contraception, but it's not what it's meant for. These are the barrier methods. The male condom, as I said, is very common. This picture it was taken from the back pocket of a woman who was working at the mall. So actually, women, when they walk these days, one of the emergency weapons that they carry in their pockets are male condoms. I, I wonder now, why should uh, there be Nokopiwa Mchunu? Nokopiwa Mchunu. 
Move out of the camera. People are seeing you. And there's a woman that will see me naked who's just moving in front of the camera. It's the most commonly used to be a male condom. So it's made of latex. Majority of condoms are made of latex. Some are made of plastic, but majority of them are made of latex. The, the, the ones that are made for plastic are those people, for those people who are allergic to latex. Because there are some women, if they put, some men, if they put a male condom, they get rash and are allergic to latex. So as an alternative, they made the one that's made of plastic. They don't only prevent pregnancy. Also, they reduce the risk of sexually transmitted infection, like HIV and other sexually transmitted infection. They have got very few side effects, except if somebody is allergic to latex, then you'll have a latex allergy. And you don't need a prescription to acquire male condom. You can even buy them at the filling station. You can buy them from the vending machine and everywhere. They're easily available. The failure rate is there, and there are things that make it to fail, which we'll see now. Most people, if they are perforated, if it's poor quality, there are some of the... every. Commodity has got its own quality. Some of the condoms, which are the free ones, are not of very good quality. They break easily and some of them have got holes. So you must be careful that when you use a condom, that you use the condom of a poor quality. And one of the failures caused by a slipped condom. And a slipped condom is a, a function of carelessness. Because if a condom is slipped, probably the man can feel that this condom has slipped. But he doesn't tell the woman that the condom has slipped because he doesn't want to stop the process. A slipped condom is one of the commonest. It's not uncommon to find a condom inside a woman who doesn't know that the condom was remained inside a, during the last quietus. So I think all women must take responsibility that if you're using condom, when you finish, say, let's see the condom. And I have said that the way it's so popular even women in their bag, you know, women always carry bag when they move. The commodity or paraphernalia in their bag will be the brush for the eyebrows, the menstrual pad, and there will be a condom also. They, they, then I ask, why is you have a condom as part of the commodities in your bag? And they say, oh, well, I don't know as much as I, maybe there's going to be an emergency sex or something. But women really did a popularizing male condom. And one should know how to apply it to, to, in, order, in order to reduce the failure. And the application is a dual responsibility. Both men and women must make sure that it's properly applied to ensure that it's, there's proper application and examine it to exclude damages to it. And condom must be used only once and be discarded. You can't, use, you can't reuse a condom. Because if you reuse it, you are reducing the effectivity of a substance. You see, a condom is wet. What makes it wet is a substance which contains what you call nonoxinol 9. Nonoxinol 9, it's a chemical that kills sperm. So once the sperm go inside, there's a chemical that kills sperm. So if you reuse it, it won't have nonoxinol 9. If you did best, then you'll fall pregnant. While actually, if it best, the sperm are exposed to nonoxinol 9. They won't make a woman pregnant. So... It should not be loose. If it's loose, it's too big for the man. Look for a smaller size. Because if it loses, it's likely to sleep, or sperms are likely to go, go, go through here, and pregnancy will be the results thereof. The only way to test whether the condom is good or not, usually when you buy them, there are three. They come in a packet of three. Test one of them. Blow it like a balloon. If air can come out, you must know that condom is poor. This will be just be sampling and discard the whole thing because if one of them is perforated, it means others might also be perforated. So that's the how to test whether a condom is a good quality or not. It is not to play as if it's a balloon. So I think females take responsibility in this women's month to make that contraceptive use is effective. Let's come to the femidom, female condom, which is a plastic bag which is placed inside the vagina to collect the sperm. It's placed by a woman there. Like male condom, it can get perforated in the hair walls and get break and sleep and left behind. It's not uncommon to find a female condom which was left behind. Even the woman doesn't know that a female condom left behind it. But it's very rare. 
It is bigger than the, the, the male condom. And it's got a ring that keeps it inside the anterior and the posterior phonix so that it can surround the cervix. And you put it very nicely with the hand and push it inside there. Putting it is very gently after opening it. You can take any position. You can put it standing, squatting, lying on your back, and put it before. And then as it goes inside there, you put it right deep inside. Outside, there's a ring that will keep it outside and remain as a bag here. Actually, you can put it hours before even you go there. We go to we go before you go to the venue where you're going to have sex, you can just leave home having put it there, knowing that you are ready. You don't have to go and put it where you are going. But usually you should put it before. It does no time limit when must be, must it be put. All women should learn how to put a female condom. The spermicides, what are the spermicides? They are surface active agents which are attached to sperm and kill the sperm. They are chemicals that kill sperm. They can come in different forms. Sometimes it can be a foam that you put into the vagina. Sometimes it's a gel that you inject into the vagina. It can come as a cream that you can apply into the vagina. They can come as vaginal suppository or soluble films. They come in different forms, spermicides. So you can buy them over the counter whether in a gel or in a film or in a suppository. There are many types of spermicides, as you can see here. These are the suppositories, a cream, a gel, and a, a ring. Having put a spermicide inside, you must put it deep inside. If it's a tablet, you push it deep inside with a finger. If it's a contraceptive film, you must make sure that it's right next on the posterior phoenix next to the cervix. If it's a sponge, push it right deep so that you mustn't rely on the penis that it must put it deep. You must push it deep yourself. Because when the sperm arrive there, the sponge, the spermicide will kill the sperms. And if you apply it inside the vagina as a cream, they will also kill the sperm. Other contraceptive method like diaphragm, which is a cap, which doesn't have any chemical on it, it just act, act as a cover to the cervix. To make it more effective, you can apply spermicides on it. And application thereof, because most spermicides are positive, because they have to melt to be effective. Apply it about 30 minutes before the process, because they have to melt. Because suppositories are usually kept at low temperature in a fridge, so you need them to melt before. But they do not protect against sexually transmitted infection, unlike the barrier method. They are only protected against pregnancy, not sexually transmitted infection. The, these are the types of the suppositories. You can see they look like the painkiller suppository and the cream and gel, which can apply the, the applicator can apply them deep, deep into the posterior phonics. This woman will teach you a little bit about spermicides. So here's the deal about spermicide. It's easy to get, has few side effects, is relatively cheap, and is often used to make other methods more effective. Spermicide is sold as a foam, gel, film, suppository, or cream. All of the forms of spermicide work the same way. They go inside of the vagina shortly before sex and stop sperm from moving. If the sperm can't move, then it can't join with the egg to cause pregnancy. Spermicide is used for a lot of reasons. It doesn't affect your hormones, you don't need a prescription from your healthcare provider, and it's relatively cheap and easy to get a hold of. Just head over to your local drugstore or supermarket. How well does it work? When used alone, spermicide is not as effective as some other methods. About 15 out of 100 women who use spermicide perfectly will get pregnant each year. That goes up to about 29 out of 100 women who don't always use it right. You can make spermicide more effective if you combine it with another form of birth control. And although spermicides are safe with very few side effects, they do not protect against sexually transmitted infections. So using a condom along with spermicide is always a good idea. If you're interested in learning more about this method, check out the info on PlannedParenthood.org. This is all about spermicides that I wanted to stress to you. Let's go to a contraceptive diaphragm which is a circular silicone dome. It is also impregnated with spermicides, because spermicides, which is inserted in the vagina to cover the cervix and prevent the entry of sperm into the cervix. 
if you use correctly the contraceptive diaphragm or a cap, it has got 95% chances of preventing pregnancy. It's very highly effective, only if it's used correctly. This means five out of 100 women will become pregnant if used correctly for one year. But it's not a popular method. It's not easily available. Many people don't even know about it. That's why I preach it. But it does not prevent against the STI, like the spermicides. Few men will report that they are feeling a diaphragm during sex, but mostly don't. And I believe those who say they are feeling it is just in their head. You can't feel it. And should be put before penetration and left for and not left more than 12 hours after penetration because it's a foreign body, it will cause vaginal infection. And sometimes diaphragm that are left before and get infected can go to a condition called toxic shock syndrome, which can kill. Is a shock, is septic shock that can kill a human being. So after using a diaphragm, take it out. If a, a diaphragm is made of latex, of course, the man is latex allergy, there will be those ir ir irritation. But the diaphragms are made of different materials such that it's catered for those who are latex allergy. This is a picture of a diaphragm. And when you put it inside, it covers the cervix and is impregnated with spermicides. When the sperms come here, they come across the spermicides, they die. So they won't be able to fertilize or move up. And putting up a diaphragm is the woman who must put it. It's got a ring that you put it inside and the ring will come and cover the cervix. And with spermicides there, you're sure that there will be effectivity of about 95%. The common one that I used are intrauterine contraceptive devices. But in the loop, some people call them loop because they are loop like this. The way loops come from the first generation contraceptives, which were looped. And the commonness of the loops is what you call lipus loop. The picture you see here is lipus loop. It's no more used now. It's one of the first generation contraceptives. It was not medicated, it was inert, and uh, could be left as long as you like it. There was no prescribed period that a loop must be left for so many. The loops now, they've got prescribed period that you must put it for three years or for five years. The lipus loop, you can, you can put it as long as you like it. That's why the weight came from loop. They come from the first generation contraceptives. And they were also radiolucent because if the strings were not visible, one would not know whether it has fallen or it's inside the uterus. If you take an X-ray, you will find that you can see that there's a loop there inside the uterus. It's just a string that got pulled inside this, the the uterus, because one otherwise one would not know whether the loop has fallen or is still there inside. That's why X-ray is very important. Even the modern ones, X-ray, they are radio. You can take, they can be visible through an X-ray. The second generation con con intrauterine contraceptive are the metallic ones. After the failure rate of the non-metallic ones like the lipus loop, they realize that to increase the effectivity, one who must put a metal on top of it. And the only metal that keeps the temperature low in the not and hostile for the sperm was copper. Copper tea. Copper doesn't uh, take heat very well. Even if the body had body temperature at 37.2, the copper will make that temperature inside the uterus lower than 37.2, about 36.8 or what. And the sperm won't survive in that temperature. The first one was a copper tea. It makes the tea so that uh, because the uterus is pear shaped, the tea can hook on the uterine cone. So it mustn't fall. And later, they may, it could last for 10 years, copper tea. And then the Nova made a Nova tea, which lasts for five years. And there come many other by the many company, including multi-load. The first generation of copper intrauterine device, the whole device was copper. But they realized copper can break its ions. So they used went back to the material that was used to make a lipus loop and only put copper on some area, on the shaft, and the horns, it's because this will not break. This uh, silicone will not break. I thought copper was breaking. You find that you are removing a loop, you come with one horn. One horn is left behind, and it's a mammoth task to go and sit for that horn. So the copper, and now the copper tea and the novelty, tea, they've got copper in some areas, but the whole body of the device is silicone, like a 
the lipus loop. And if put inside, the tree goes inside the cornea here and stabilizes it so that it mustn't come. And the string comes out through the cervix. And every time you go for a checkup, when they see the string, they say, okay, it's still in situ. You don't have to go for x-ray. There are many types. Many companies make things in different types. This is the, the most popular one, the multi-load loop, which also had as a copper. This is the one that the second generation that came evolved from the lipus loop is multi-load. The one thing about a contraceptive, intratrial contraceptive, you can go for a checkup and the doctor say, or the nurse says, I don't see the strings. It's either two things have happened. It's either it has fallen during menstruation, because it can be hooked by a tampon or anything or fallen, or the strings were too short, they went inside. That was a misplaced intratrial device. And more often, you find that they take a decision that it has fallen. Because you don't want to fall pregnant, you say, hey, let me put another one. You put another one. It's not uncommon to find that a person has got two intratrial devices inside. One which has fallen, then they put another one there too. But by the time he removes this one, he wants to fall pregnant. He doesn't fall pregnant because there's still another loop inside here. So before you take a decision that the, the, the loop has fallen, if you haven't seen it, Take X-ray, make sure that it's not inside. Nowadays, with even vaginal ultrasound, you can see a loop if it's inside or not. Don't take that decision. This is the copper tea that we usually use and the Nova tea. They've got a copper shaft or copper shaft. Even these horns of a copper tea have got copper inside there. That's why they use copper. The third generation are the modern ones, which are hormonal hormonal or intrauterine contraceptive device. Very safe, very effective. They contain a progesterone inside. They come into forms. Progesterone set, which lasts for two years. It's not available in South Africa. And Mirena. Mirena is available in South Africa. They come in three forms. There's one that lasts for three years. There's one that can last for five years. And there's Mirena that can last for 10 years. When you buy it, it depends on how long do you want to space your, your, your bed. If you want to space for three years, you buy the one that lasts for three years. If you want to space for five years, you buy the one that lasts for five years. If you want long term, you buy the one that lasts for 10 years. I haven't never met anybody who buys the one for 10 years because the higher the number of years, the higher the price. So this, it contains a shaft. Let's talk about Mirena, which is on the right. Inside this reservoir, there is a hormone called levonorgestrel which is slowly released. If it lasts for three years, it will be released for three years. And that three years, it makes the endometrium hostile for implantation. And it makes the sperm, the area hostile for sperm to pass and fertilize the egg. And it makes the mucus plaque, which covers the cervix and prevent the sperm and infection to enter. And if you sit it inside the uterus, you can see it with an ultrasound. It fits very well with the shape of the uterus which is a pear-shaped cavity. So this is Mirena inside the uterus, how it sits. The, the flanges of the Mirena, they go inside the, where there is a tubal ostia. And this pear-shaped structure, it fits well in, and the strings come out through the cervix. If the Mirena is here, over the years, it keeps on releasing the hormone, level adjustral there. And it inhibits the sperm function and motility. And uh, this, you know, every month a woman endometrium grows and then she bleeds, it grows again, she bleeds. That's what's called menstruation. It makes this endometrium very thin, such that even there's, if there's fertilization, there cannot be implantation because the endometrium doesn't decidualize. The endometrium that is ready for pregnancy is called decidualized endometrium. Then, this, if it's in some women, it can even cause amenorrhea. You can even stop period because the endometrium is so thin that there's nothing to shed during menstruation. And on the cervix, it makes a thick mucus plaque there. And this thick mucus, it helps because infection won't go in, and so the sperms won't go in. It's a very effective contraception, Mirana, third generation. And then, 
The contraceptive intrauterine device must be put in during menstruation. Why during menstruation? Because during menstruation, there are two advantages. You are sure there's no pregnancy if a man is menstruating. Two, during menstruation, the cervix is slightly open. So insertion is not painful. You don't have to manually dilate the cervix. Or some women can put it exactly immediately after birth when the cervix is still open. You can still put in and contraceptive device. Although it runs the chances of falling, but most of them don't fall. Those are the reasons. And uh, to put an intratrine contraceptive device, you need a trained healthcare provider to put it. You can't just put it by a novice. So, because it's got its own side effects. It, it, it must be a hormonal. Hormonal one, they've got this tendency of causing irregular breakthrough bleeding. Menstruation, initially, when you're a few months after putting it, you don't know where you're menstruating. You keep on spotting and stopping, spotting and stopping. But as time goes on, it goes away. And the cramp, they call it pain, but it's not pain, it's cramp. As the uterus feels that there is a foreign body inside here, it contracts against it. And for a few months, you'll have some cramps. The non-hormonal one, that doesn't form the mucus on the plaque. If there can be infection, and infection find a foreign body there, that infection will flare. That's why you don't put intrauterine contraceptive device, most people non hormonal one, in a woman who doesn't have children. This is not a school girl's contraception because should she get infected, that infection will fulminate into pelvic inflammatory disease. It's likely to block her tubes and she will never have babies anymore. So intrauterine loop is not for, for girls. It's for women who have got children who would not mind even if they cannot make an, any other children anymore. One of the complications is that if it's, it's not put by somebody who knows what he's doing can cause perforation of the uterus. It's not uncommon to find the loop inside the abdominal cavity. And it does not prevent ectopic pregnancy. It only prevents pregnancy inside the uterus where it's seated. It doesn't prevent pre ectopic pregnancy. So you can still have ectopic pregnancy should the sperm pass there. This is what Mirena, what that I told you about. The next group of contraceptives that is going to discuss are hormonal contraceptives, oral contraceptives. We start with oral. Hormonal can be oral, can be injectable. I didn't discuss much of injectable, but I'll talk about them. The combined pill. The combined pill, what they call combined pill, because in them, in one tablet, there is a combination of female hormones, estrogen and progesterone, a different uh, concentrations and they usually come in a packet in 28 but the active tablets in this packet are 21 the seven usually which are red or a different color the seven that makes it 28 are called placebos it's just to keep the rhythm for you not to lose the rhythm you need only 21 days of active tablets to prevent pregnancy but to keep your rhythm they make them 28 so that you must drink every day. That's why you can see that you bleed when you take the placebos, when you take the, the red ones or the one with the different ones. But majority of them, they just make them all white, not knowing which one is a placebo. They only differentiate by the size. Maybe you find that placebo is bigger than the other ones. But the active tablets are 21. They are, the tablets, they also have the progestin only tablets. The progesterone only tablet. They contain only one hormone, progesterone, which are good for breastfeeding because combined ones they tend to suppress breast milk production. If you are breastfeeding, you use this one. It's not as effective as a combined one, but it's good for breastfeeding because breastfeeding if also it's fact it's got some contraceptive effects. So if you add the breastfeeding contraceptive to the contraceptive effect of a progesterone only pill, then you are covered. And if a woman who has got cardiovascular heart problems, they, it is not advisable for them to take estrogen. They are take, given progesterone only tablet. They, they've got a very low pearl index. I'll explain the pearl index later. And for people who are old, whose fertility or fecundity is low, they can take them because people who are over 35, they're not as fertile. Their fertility is so low. So if we make their slow fertility plus the contraceptive effect of progesterone only, it is safe. The contraception have got 
some benefits besides being contraceptive. There are some non-contraceptive benefits of contraception. Because if your menstruation is irregular, you can control them by taking oral contraceptive. Most people are triphasic ones. And if menstruation is heavy, you can use contraception. They will reduce the menstruation and your hemoglobin will be high. Some women who have got painful menstruation, contraception control that. And the even bone mineral density of women in acne, there are contraception that are used solely as a treatment for acne, like the 85 and mesilon. If a woman has got acne, you treat with that. They've got cyprotron acetate inside it. Some women with hesitism, hesitism can be reduced, not treated by contraception. If you've got a excessive hair loss, alopecia, contraceptives or estrogen inside it can reduce that hair loss. And it's also shown to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer and endometrial overgrowth, which is a precursor of endometrial cancer called hyper hyperplasia of the endometrium. And women with endometriosis, those are the injectable ones because they stop the menstruation and adenomyosis. They can reduce the pain of endometriosis and reduce the recurrence of endometriosis. Hence, as we say that it reduces endometrial hyperplasia. If hyperplasia left too long, it will go into cancer of the endometrium. So endometriosis, uh, or contraceptives, most the oral one, will reduce the chances of endometrial cancer and the risk of fibroid and ovarian cyst and cystic breast diseases, cancer of the rectum. The incidence of PID, I've just alluded that if you put on the third generation intrauterine contraceptive device, the chances of PID are low because it makes the mucus plug there and the cervix. And some women, they've got what you call premenstrual tension or premenstrual mood disorder, dysphobic mood disorder. It can reduce that. And those with asthma tend to be more controllable. And these are hormonal. Other two hormonal are injections, which can either taken every three months or they can be taken every two months in the form of nerethrate or depomodrexy progesterone and acetate. One form of contraception, which should not be used routinely, is what we call postcoital contraception. No lazy. No lazy Africa. Please put your hand down. No lazy wa Africa. Please put your hand down, my darling. <clears throat> Postcoital contraception. That shall called morning after peel. Morning after peel. They are very unreliable. And there's a very high pregnancy rate. It's not a contraception that one can rely on. It's called emergency contraceptive. You take it in the form of emergency. I tend to not to understand why should the contraceptive be emergency. Emergency what? Well, after emergency sex, is there things called there was an emergency sex that you can have emergency contraception? They say it's emergency contraception in case of emergency. There's no emergency sex contraception. It's just money after pee. There's nothing called contraception here. Sex was an emergency. Usually they use nevalogesterone, which is progesterone only. Which either they use nevalogesterone or mephipristone. Mephipristone oh. is called RU486, which is also can also cause abortion. This one can prevent pregnancy. If pregnancy were okay, RU486 can cause abortion. Another method of post contraception is insertion of a loop. If you realize that you have had unprotected sex, you insert a loop immediately thereafter, immediately the loop will stop prevention. Actually, a loop, you can put it even five days after sex, then it will work. While majority of hormones, you must put them within 72 hours after sex for them to be effective. If 72 can elapse, then they don't. Emergency contraception are used as an emergency step before missed period. Before you miss the period, they prevent pregnancy following unprotected sex or unexpected failure of contraception. If you think the contraception is going to fail, maybe you had vomiting, you had diarrhea, you think absorption was poor, then you can use emergency contraception. They are popularly known as the names, as I've said, this postcoital contraception, morning after pill, 
and secondary contraception in case where you suspect, expect that another contraceptive method might have failed. It's usually used for after rape or forced sex. It's better to take morning after pill, and which should be taken within 72 hours after the sex activity. The, one, the first emergency contraception or morning after pill that was taken was called USPA regimen. They use, in USPA regimen, we use ordinary uh, combined pill. You take two combined pill and take another two combined pill uh, after 12 hours. You, you take four combined pill. They work so effectively, but later they discovered that there's no need for estrogen. If you give 0.75 or 1.2 milligram of progestogen only, it will work the same as use per pill. That's why nowadays you find that they give you as one tablet of 1,2 or 1,5 milligram of novel adjustment. You take it once within 72 hours, it can. Or they keep you half, half the dosage. Some come in 0.75 milligrams in tablets. You take one, after 12 hours you take another one, but they must all fall within 72 hours. Then you are protected. One of the common side effects of contra hormonal contraceptives, I want to say hormonal, I mean the pill, and the injections. It's what you see here. It's weight gain. They increase your metabolism and you start eating too much. Then you blame the contraception. It's because you they make your liver metabolism, they've got a good metabolic effect. Your absorption becomes good and your appetite becomes good. Then you eat too much. And it can cause, cause, cause breast tenderness because they contain estrogen and the, the cardiovascular effect, of course, the clotting effect. That's why people who have got a heart disease are not supposed to use combined contraceptives. They rather use other methods like loop, not hormonal contraceptives. This cloasma or melasma is commonest side effect of contraception, which is on the cheek, and women don't like it. And this, I don't know the treatment of cloasma. Even dermatologists, they struggle. It's a dermatological light man to treat this. So if a woman is light-skinned and need to be prescribed hormonal contraceptives, warn her that she might develop cloasma. But majority of black women are so dark, they're even darker than the cloasma, so they don't develop cloasma. But if you are light-skinned, you will develop cloasma. Let's go to the depo formulation. Depo formulation, the first one, which is the first that, that came into the market was depo-medroxyprogesterone acetate. Some people use it depo, but it's depo prover. It comes at 150 milligrams of progesterone. It's progesterone only, and it's applied every 12 weeks, three months injection. And the second one that came into the market was norasterate, which you take one ample every eight weeks, which means this one, you take it two monthly norasterate, Depometroxy progesterone acetate three monthly. Then there are other methods that are also type of formulation called implanon, which contained a substance called eternogestrel. Eternogestrel, it lasts three months, three years subcutaneously, but implanon, it lasts three years. And then there came a no plant, no plant which contained levonorgestrel, the same hormone that is found inside uh, Mirena. It lasts five years. But depending on the country, I think in South Africa, more implanon is more common than no plant. No plant was more common deep in Africa. Then. South Africa, the one that in the depot formulation that we use, is one that lasts for three years, which is implanon. I've never seen no plant in here. So such that the brand name no plant in South Africa is sort of discontinued. But the whole it doesn't mean the whole world is discontinued. It's just South Africa we don't have it. These are subdermal implants. They are implanted under the skin. One capsule, it got six salicylic capsules, small capsule that contains a hormone each one. Each capsule contains 36 milligrams of nevolagestral and offers. If it's a no plant, it will offer five years protection. So let's just see how a no plant is applied so that you mustn't be scared to apply it. <laughs>
You see how easy was it to apply implanon? You put it, you fit it for three years, you forget. If the child is going to school, is going to university or a boarding school or college, and you think she might be naughty and come back with unwanted pregnancy, put an implant on and plan on and you forget the implant on will stay in. There are other various methods of contraception that are used. The first one of the miscellaneous method is the one that's most effective. It's got 100% effectiveness. There's no pregnancy. I call it an ideal contraceptive. It's called abstinence. Children should be taught about abstinence, to abstain. Nobody has ever been pregnant after abstinence. No one. So it's one of the best contraception methods that should be pushed. Actually, we must, all, all of us, we must propagate and preach abstinence as the best contraceptive methods. The other method, like quietus interruptus, which is synonymous as, they call it withdrawal method or pulling out method on anism. It's not a reliable method because it's men-dependent and men, most men don't comply. You can't rely on it. The rhythm method is a method that you use the time, you time your periods, the time you avoid sexual intercourse during the time when you are most fertile, around ovulation. And some people go on to use the body, basal body temperature method. You know, the temperature of a human being, is going to, it raises about 1.5 degrees Celsius from the follicular phase after ovulation to the luteal phase. So once when the temperature starts raising, you know that you are just about to ovulate. You know, avoid that. But this is a very unreliable method because it depends when you take a temperature. Sometimes you can have flu and the temperature goes up and you think that's the, that's the time you shouldn't while it's not. But it's not a very reliable method. Cervical mucus. Cervical mucus around ovulation is got what you call spin by gait. It, it elongates and it's more fluid. So if you find that during the time when you become more fluid, the cervical mucus become more fluid, that the time that you are likely to fall pregnant is around ovulation. So they avoid sex during that time. But you must be very much learned to use that method, like the rhythm method. As you see, from menstruation up to day seven after menstruation, probably is remote from ovulation. So pregnancy is not possible at that time. But from day eight onwards, the, some sperms can live longer to reach the, the day 12, which are the days that you are more likely to fall pregnant. From, from day 12 to day 16 of your menstruation is a danger zone. That's the, the, the time that you must avoid. But to play safe, take it from day 8 up to day 20. These are the days that you can take if you want to use the rhythm method. If you want to, if you have, want to engage during this time, then use other form of additional contraception. Like if you use the calendar method, it's the same as the rhythm method. From day 10 to day 20, you avoid sex during that time. All other times you can have it, it won't be. But it needs you to be very much educated. You must have a temperature, like if you want to use the basal body temperature, you must have a thermometer early before bed, before you wake up, you take it a, a, a temperature, you plot it on a graph, by the time it rises up, this is the time you have ovulated. It's the time that you shouldn't. As I've said that, there are many diseases that can elevate your temperature and fool you that you think it's this time you are ovulation. Why is it not the time for ovulation? Uh -huh. The terminal methods, I've described them as sterilizations. They are classified as permanent methods. Although with technologies these days, some are reversible, but the success rate after reversing is so poor that Let's classify them as irreversible. The, before you use the terminal method, you must be sure that your family is complete. You're not going to change that after and say, I want reversal. Because the reversal is difficult. And it's got the chances that if it's a female sterilization, chances of ectopic are very high. But they are done as an outpatient procedure, no hospitalization. It can be done under local anesthesia, more especially vasectomy in men. And, and, and it protect the in female, it protects immediate protection after that. But in male, it doesn't. I'll show you. Male, after it's uh, sterilized, she has done vasectomy. She's not sterile until she, you do sperm count and semen analysis and find that she has got no sperms. 
Let's see this one and which will show us and demonstrate us how vasectomy is done. And I encourage men also, if they've completed their family, to do vasectomy. Not only women should. In this video, you will learn what happens to the sperm after a vasectomy. After the vasectomy, the sperm continue to be produced by the testes. They continue to mature in the epididymis and are brought into the vas to the level of vasectomy. At this point, there is a blockage. The sperm live here. They have a lifespan of two to three weeks. The sperm then die. The dead sperm are broken into small pieces and particles. These particles are then absorbed by the body. In this way, the old sperm are removed from the vas and the new sperm are produced by the testes. This cycle continues for many years after the vasectomy. On the abdominal side of the vas deferens, at the time of vasectomy, there are a lot of sperm that have gone across before the procedure. These sperm can produce a pregnancy. Therefore, it must be understood that vasectomy does not impart immediate sterility. A person should be considered fertile till all the sperm are washed out. This may take 20 to 25 ejaculations on average. We perform semen analysis three months after the vasectomy to assess if the sperm have been washed out. With regular sexual activity, 97% of the patients do not have any sperm in their ejaculate at three months. 2 to 3% of patients will still have some sperm at three months after the vasectomy. They may require another semen test after an additional 5 to 10 ejaculations. We hope this video has helped you understand. I'm sure you this explained the vasectomy more than I can explain. The one of the terminal methods that are there is female sterilization. Sterilized. There are many methods of sterilizing a woman, and each method has its own effectivity and failure rates. The commonest that is used and which is reversible is called the permaroy method of sterilization. This can be reversed because you I'll describe the permaroy as we go. Another one is Yuhida, which has got a less least chance of failure rate, but reversibility is very difficult in Yuhida method. I think in the Parkland method are really used, but they are even better than uh, Pomeroy. They, all this method, they use absorbable suture material, which means after the suture material is absorbed, then the tubes separate. That reduces the chances of recanalization. Before you sterilize, go and discuss, discuss with your adult what method are you going to use. If you are going to use Uchida, you know that the chances of reversal are very, very, very low. Difficult or impossible, but pemoroy can be reversed under micro microsurgical procedures. Many people can reverse pomeroy. So if you are not certain that you really you are not going to change, go for pomeroy, or don't go for sterilization at all. It can be done through a laparoscope. If it's done laparoscopically, can be a one-day procedure. Go in in the morning, you go out in the afternoon. But if we have done through laparotomy in a center where there's no laparoscopy or the anatomy, we've got previous surgeries that lapar laparotomy, the laparoscopy is not possible, then you might stay for some few days in the hospital, uh, even after Pomeroy. At cesarean section, the commonest method that is used at cesarean section is the Pomeroy method of sterilization, where you to make a loop on the tube and tie that loop and cut that distal part for histological evaluation to make sure that what you have cut is really a tube, not a round ligament, because there are areas where people have cut round ligaments instead of a tube. Make a loop, you tie around the loop and take a scissor, you cut that piece. This piece, you send it to the for histological evaluation to confirm. But in case if there can be recanalization, you have got evidence that what you care, what you cut is indeed a tube. It's just that recanalization is one of the methods of one of the side effects of contraception sterilization, which can cause lead to pregnancy. But usually after this absorbable procedure material is absorbed, the, the distal and the proximal part, they got so separate from one another that 
chances of recharacterizations are nearly nil. The, this is Yukida method. Yukida method of sterilization, if you do it, regard it as a permanent method. It was designed to reduce the failure rate of the pomeroy because pomeroy is the first one, but it had failure rate like sterility, uh, recanalization. The endiochida, after cutting, the proximal part of the tube is buried inside the wall of the uterus. It's buried inside the myometrium. Like you see the proximal part, and make a hole on the uterus and bury it there and it heals there with fibrosis. So you can't come in and, and exhume it from there. And if it's buried inside here, the distal part is far away from it, so that even if an egg comes from an ovary and taken by the fimbria, it's got no chance of reaching the uterus because that one is kept and buried inside here. It takes a bit longer. It can have bleeding. You can't do it during the cesarean section because of the bleeding that will occur. But at interval, you can do it. The Yukida method, which I said, is an Iving, Iving method in Parkland. The Iving method, this is the Iving method, where they inject the adrenaline solution or a solution that will stop blood from flowing, vasoconstrictor. And after the inject uh, vasoconstrictor, you remove part of the segment of the tube and throw it away so that only the distal part remains, the proximal part is not there. It's a longer method, that's why it's not so it's no more used. The parklands and Iving are more or less the same, except that in parklands, you don't cut, you just tie and tie, it just has tubal ligation. While in Iving, you tie and throw away. The one that I always teach to gender, never do it. Because women, you can never know women. They can change their mind. Situation can change. She might be widowed. She might be remarried. The one child may die. And she might want to have a baby thereafter. It's Kruna's method of sterilization, which is called fimbriectomy. You cut the fimbrial part of the tube and throw it away. If you cut the fimbrial part and throw it away, there's no way you are going to sterile, to reverse this thing because the fimbria are the one that is going to pick the egg from the ovary, on the surface of the ovary. So this is a method that should never be done. It's like a tubectomy, to remove the whole fallopian tube because if you remove the fimbria, you have injured that tube permanently. It's a method, but it's not much propagated. Mm -hmm. The Shirotka method, one of the methods that takes much, the proximal part of the tube after you have separated from the distal part, you fold it up towards the uterus and tie it. I don't see the need for this. I don't know why it's the need. Shirotka was just uh, just that just wanted to be funny. Because even if you don't leave it, you leave it like Unukita, it will not, uh, it doesn't make any difference. But the Shirotka folds them, the proximal and the distal part. There are many methods of sterilization which you should know and discuss with the healthcare provider, the one who's going to sterilize you, before you sterilize. The another method, which is laparoscopic, a day procedure, can be done in and out procedure. There are two methods that I'm going to show you here. One is laparoscopic fallopian ring sterilization, which you can do it as an outpatient, even under a conscious sedation, not deep anesthesia. Today we are going can to be done. Out of applicator or a laparoscopic. This is how to demonstrate how this is an applicator for fallopian ring. We are now taking a fallopian ring. That's the ring. The ring cone. This ring cone is attached to the laparoscopic, and with the help of a ring pusher, this fallopian ring is loaded over the laparoscopic. One or both rings can be loaded at a time. Here we are using one ring. So note how a laparoscopic is held with the help of fingers and thumb like a syringe. Now your ring delivery collar is set at either one or two depending upon the number of rings. When we are loading both the rings, we first select one, apply the ring, move it to two and apply the second ring. When we are loading only one ring at a time, we have to select two. So here we have loaded one ring and we have selected number two. So we now enter the peritoneal cavity, visualize the fallopian tubes. And Suppose that cloth is a fallopian tube. At the we are tube. going to move the fingers away from the thumb, which is going to open the jaws. Get hold of the fallopian tubes and move the fingers towards the thumb, which closes the jaws, pulls the fallopian tube inside the lumen of the laparoscopic and releases a ring over the tube. The fingers are again moved away from the thumb, 
which opens the jaws and releases the tube out of the lumen of the laprocator. The application of ring over the fallopian tube is checked. The procedure is repeated on the opposite side and hemostasis checked. This is the how to apply the fallopian ring. At the end of application, the ring will be sitting like you're doing a pomeroy and it constricted there. It stays there forever and block the tube. The other method, which is more popular, is one that is described by Mr. F Dr. Filchi. I must say that I'm proud that I had an opportunity of talking to Dr. Filchi in way back in 1996 in Chicago when we went for the Congress and the course for international ISG, international endoscopic uh, Congress. And Mr. Filchi told me how he came to designed the filtered lip as a competitor to falloperin. Falloperin came first, filtered came last. And he uses titanium stainless steel metal. And it's most popular in South Africa. I actually, if I use sterilization laparoscopically, I don't use falloperin. I use filtered lip. Maybe I'm influenced by the fact that I know filtered personally. This is how to apply a filtered lip sterilization. It's also done as a day procedure. You can do it today in the morning, in the afternoon, you're home. The, the hole is so small that you, you cannot, uh, there's no pain. Pain is quite tolerable. With the tube, we would identify the thinnest portion of the tube, which is the isthmus, and you grasp it, and make sure that you grasp the entire tube, and uh, examine, and then find that your clip is transecting the entire tube, then you can clip it, and it locks there, and stay there for the rest of your life. The only thing about it, if you've got falloper ring in there, when you are at the airport to pass there, something will say, tweet, tweet. You must tell them, the, they say to yourself, it's because of this titanium ring. They, they will always, the, the metal, they'll be detected by metal detector at the airports or the, at points of security. You can see here that the entire tube is, is transected and it, you, then you go to the next tube with after loading the second clip and you look for the thinnest portion, which is the fimbria. You don't pull it out. You identify the tube by identifying the fimbria and you grasp it there. After grasping, you examine whether you've grasped the entire tube. If you haven't grasped the entire tube, you open the, the jaws and go to area where you show that I've, I've grasped the entire tube. Once you've grasped the entire tube, like here, I'm sure I've grasped the entire tube. You pull your trigger and leave the clip there. And you examine, you find that the entire tube is traversed by the pilot clip, both sides. Then you're happy that it, it failure rate is very rare, very rare. Some people, if failure rate is there, is when we have tied a wrong, ligam, wrong structure, like wrong ligament. How do you evaluate the contraceptive methods? We use a, a PEL index. Every contraceptive method has got its own effectivity, its own reliability. The commonest technique to evaluate it in clinical trials is by using a PEL index. It's named after an American scientist who's called Raymond Pell. It measures the effectiveness of the contraceptive in preventive pregnancy. The smaller the PEL index, the more effective and reliable the method is. Let me explain it this way. If 100 women uses the same contraceptive for one year and three of them become pregnant, the PEL index is said to be three, which means if 100 women use the contraceptive, the PEL, uh, one of them fall pregnant, the PEL index is said to be one, which means the smaller the PEL index, the more reliable is the contraceptive. Let's look at this one, the PEL indexes. If there's no method used, the chances that in one year you'll fall pregnant is 80%. Not all women who don't use any method will fall pregnant within one year. About 80% of them will fall pregnant. In a male condom, if it's used properly, the failure rate, only 2 to 14 people will fall pregnant. If this is a female condom, only 5 to 21 will fall pregnant, which means the female condom the male condom is more reliable than the female condom because the pell index of the male condom is lower than that of the female condom. A loop 
If 100 women use a loop for one year, only half, there's still half a human being. Not comma five to two, two women will fall pregnant because the loop also has got a failure rate. Oral contraceptives, pill index is not comma one to not comma five, which means oral contraceptives, if used properly, are the most reliable one. So I don't have a pill index of the one that I said it's a ideal contraceptive, which is abstinence. Probably a pill index of abstinence is zero. So this is a formula for calculating the pill index. We calculate the number of pregnancies that occur in 12 months, multiplied by 12, divided by 100, then it will give you the pell index. The reliability of a contraception is calculated by its pell index. And its contraception, if properly used, it got its own pell index. So in conclusion, although there's an academic component of this presentation, the objective was to challenge to all parents because teenage pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy, child molestation, child neglect, abortions are something that no society should be proud if they have it. And I, as in my introduction, men should talk to boys and women should talk to women. It's not nice for them, it's not easy for a man to talk to girls. In a structured way, I challenge all these women, the women learn to say women should talk, we're everything about women. Make a structured way of raising a girl child and teach them about the dangers of using contraception, the danger of early sexual people, the dangers of unwanted pregnancy. We can't have a women who their duty, they just make noise. They want to be like men. How can a woman who cross that to be like a man? A tomboy. So it must do these dangers of abortion, physical and psychological dangers of abortion and psychosomatic stress disorders. So I'm going to put this webinar on my YouTube channel and send some of you the, the link. And although some of your children are not here, use it as an educational tool. And I established focus group to address this, the need of a girl child. A girl child need a girl, you know? We can't have a situation where women say they want to have equal to men. Of course, it's just gender equity. But we don't want to make what you call masculinization of females. Or feminization of male. We can't change that. Men are men, women are men. Men must talk to boys, women must talk to women. To some extent, with some limitation, women men may talk to, to girls. But this, for, because it's August Women's Month, is a challenge to all women. You know, our mothers used to have structured schools, I call them schools, retreats, where they take girls at the winter or during summer school for a week or two to go and teach them womanhood. Men don't go. They teach them how to look after menstruation, how to behave kobo hadi how to handle a man, how to rear mm. children, what pregnancy is all about. They teach them. But our children now, they learn by trial and error. We don't teach them. The girl child remains the most neglected species. They have to learn womanhood by trial and error. By the time she learns that, she's got two or three children. Women abandon their societal and parental role as mothers. All that they want, they are basically striving for equality with men. You can't be equal to men because genetically you are not equal. Maybe you are even more than men. Because if I was a woman, I wouldn't strive for equality to men. Because my reason is that I don't think I can, if I was a woman, I could uh, strive to be equal to somebody who during sometimes during his lifetime was dependent on my breast milk. I wouldn't. I'm always higher than you. So actually, women are higher than men, but they are striving to be like men, which means they want to come down to the level of a man. So the men have not lost their role on the boy child. They, 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 the real men will teach them child, don't do this. 
we still have to come Java we take them to mountain school and teach them say Java said you will let me share you quickly guy while say she was going but not coming and teach them comma in this in this modern way not in the previous way but you can still call comma and teach them what is relevant now we must really look back to the basic in a modernized way we don't want this thing here of masculinization of women it can't be. There must be a man, there must be a woman. Even the Bible oh. says so. So this thing of saying, hey, reality is nobody has to like anybody. Everybody has got a role to play. It takes you to tango. We are together. You look at this one. Let us are you to teach you want to lena go to other areas. I like Askuku. Askuku, they still do those things. They don't even forget in their rooms. So, and I come to do something. foi engare re musadi o ya ba moisha foyeng o isha ke ba gekolo o ba basadi ba o ilong gore a nyetse le bona ba ile foyeng ba tse ba gore go ya go dirwa eng re re ya foyeng ba nna ba go ya basadi le ba gekolo ba ilong gore ba ilo fa eh musadi o la melao le dikoma tsa gore na ga botsebotse ka mola ka moreng monna o swara jwang re re tla tabeng ya go hala le go ga how many of you have ever taught trust uh, discuss sex education with their children, not the contraception. They don't. They just learn in the street. So, we, women this month, as they celebrate Women's Day, they must celebrate their role as model for the girl child and advance the interests of the girl child. And we need to see the emergence or resurgence of structured program tailored to prepare the child for proper womanhood and parenthood and redefine and understand the way gender equality as I define in gender equity. Nobody must say we want gender equality. We must try for gender equity. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, as you're preparing the questions, men and women, when they come back from this structured school where they teach the girls how to prepare them for manhood, they make a big feast. It's graduation. And they dance. Oh. Yes, I prepared yourself for the questions. Ladies and gentlemen, it'll take one minute. Can I accept now questions? This was the end of the webinar. I'm got my greed here. Yeah, I see people that I know here. Yeah. The guy in Zwani. Let me make you unmute yourself. I know you can't unmute yourself. I always forget. <laughs> <what to make>. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> Lea <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> 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 Monado 
question for you to raise questions just raise up your hands and discussion not only questions discussions and comments and everything let's take that this is an opportunity if you raise your hand i will show you how to i'll see you here even you don't know contraception you don't want to talk about contraception Come, my friend. Just unmute. Let me see. Come, my friend. Can you unmute? But Charles could unmute himself. It seems Kavalo cannot unmute himself. Who else can unmute himself? Let me test with this word. Uh, Dr. Masupie, try to unmute yourself and see if you can unmute yourself. Maybe the problem with the program, people cannot unmute themselves. Charles, uh, Charles Maget, unmute yourself. Let's see. Yeah, you yeah. can unmute yourself. People can unmute themselves. Okay, if there are no comments, no question, I'll ask my friend who is usually here. I don't see him here. He's a teacher. All his career, he was teaching at the medical school. He's produced so many doctors and professors. He's a professor. I respect him so much. Somebody who qualified and his job was to teach doctors to blow back. Sam Munugan, I saw him here. Where are you, Professor Munugan? I don't see you anymore. You've locked off. He's not here. I, I, I know a lot of people. Dr. Happy, how is military? Dr. Happy? Hello, Doc. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Dr. New. Hey, tell us, you are a woman. How do yes. you approach this thing of contraception? Whose role do you think it is in this woman's, woman's mind? I think it's uh, both parents' uh, uh, responsibility because a child does not belong to a woman only. It's uh, two, two people involved, so both people can approach uh, the sexual sexuality or uh, as we can see these days there's a lot of, of uh, fe femicides and all that so I think it's the responsibility out. of both parents can you hear me doc um, yeah yeah well hello yeah. yes hello? Dr. Abir is a text you to tango Parents must yeah. not call the girl and discuss to talk about sexual issues with him. Maybe he's right. Who's got another view? How do you approach this thing? You as a doctor, it's fine as a professional to discuss it. But do, do you think you need to encourage your patients to do that? Hello? I don't see any hand here. Okay, can Zadi Baloi? You put your hand up, unmute and comment. Hi, Doc. Hi, can Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, my, my, I had a different question. Mm. I wanted to find out if your higher dose combined oral contraceptives have the same effect for acne as the low dose. So, for instance, in someone that's dealing with um, breakthrough bleeding on the low dose. For cycle control, the higher the dose, the, the trifacil, the overalls, the higher dose ones, they are good at cycle control because there's much estrogen there. But on acne... There are specific ones that are 
for acne. They must contain, their progesterone inside here must be anti-acne substance called cyproterone acetate. If you look into Mesilon, you look into Marvelon, you look into Diane 35, you see the type of progesterone that is there is the one that is has got anti-acne. Not all of them are anti-acne. Actually, most of them high dose will give you fatness and will give you sweating, wet, I mean, oily skin, not necessarily acne. The contraceptives that are anti-acne, there are specific ones. And the commonest popular one is Marvelon and Dian35. But the higher the dose, the better the cycle control. But the less the side effect. This oh. is the cardiovascular side effect. This is why they made the dosage lower. It's to reduce the side of cardiovascular side effect. But as you reduce the side of cardiovascular side effect, you lose the effectivity. In any way, you lose cycle control. That's why you say they've got uh, breakthrough bleeding. You can't gain both. You gain this side, you lose this side. I hope I've explained it, Kanzani. Yes, Doc. Thank you. Okay, raise your, your hand down. I see Cabello Mbapiki. Cabello? Yes, Doc. I'm back. I I know, Doc. I actually logged in on my desktop, so I don't have a speaker there, so I logged in on my phone. Hi, mm -hmm. Doc. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Cabello, very okay. well. Okay. Um, I'm not a I'm not a doc. Thank you. Um, I'm not a doctor. A doc. I'm a I'm a, I'm a physio, ne? but keep keep at least I work in the public sector. I just wanna know from your side, how can we as healthcare professionals, especially in the public sector, advise or try to advise these women in these rural communities, in these farming communities, who keep saving babies after babies with no means of supporting these babies and we want to promote uh, actual sterilization and uh, how do we actually encourage them because I know in my hospital where I work we struggle every month when we get the data from from the clinics to to sending patients for sterilization into the hospital I want to know from your side how do we encourage these communities to for 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 sterilization especially somebody who's got a baby six seven eight kids in in this day and age thank you i think it's a it's a thing that uh, you have to educate the community at large because women believe that they belong to men and they belong to society there are a lot of myth before we educate and dispel all the myths, because there is this thing that's a myth that says sterilization, it uh, inhibits the man's potency, is a bad thing. So if a woman, because a respectful woman who doesn't want to disappoint the family, will not go easily for sterilization without consent of her Unless, husband, although the rule says you can sterilize without it. It's just during antenatal. If antenatal care at the hospital was structured in such a way that a man and a woman can attend, that is an opportune time to discuss family spacing and family planning. But our hospital and clinic are structured in such that they don't accommodate males as chaperones during antenatal care because these things should be discussed antenatally and they can go and discuss it at home. But just to say, woman, when she delivers and you say, now this is the ninth child. Let's sterilize. You see, you are, it's not an opportune time to, say, to think of sterilization. And because women usually consult men as much as men consult women. Like Dr. Appy said, the child belongs to two. All reproductive rights belong to two. You can't just do another one without another one, besides what the law say. I think to answer your question, we need a lot of public education. And we need to structure our state and natural care, such that can be like private, where men and women can come together to discuss the pregnancy, go through the pregnancy, discuss the birth, discuss contraception, breastfeeding, all about. But our clinical structures are that men won't be allowed. I, I see the problem that you have. Thank you so much, We won't have it for a long time as long as we don't run our clinics the way we run it. It will be Dr. Another one, Dr. Mclante. 
to lecture. I did not discuss the patch. I see your question here. You said the patch. Why? There's a patch called Evra patch, contraceptive. That is not a contraceptive. It's a poison. It's been removed by FDA some years back because it caused liver disease, it caused blood clotting, it caused all sorts of problems. The same as the uh, implants, it causes a lot of problems, but uh, our government doesn't remove it. But implants, I can say, I can bail them out. The problems are not as much as a patch. That's why I didn't talk about a patch here. Because anybody who says there's a patch for contraception, which absorption bypasses yeah. the liver, first pass metabolism. And there's such those women they have sudden death and everything. There's a lot of lawsuits in America about a patch, but FDA removed it. But South Africa, we didn't remove it. So they produce it for third world countries. So a patch to me is not a contraception. I didn't discuss it. Matante, you want to say something? I see you are muted. Whatever is on offer for us. But I thought we are as and the minister. Hey. Yes. I mean I'm not a meeting there. Yeah. But then you don't mention my questions on the chat. Go to the chat. Okay. You yeah, see my okay. questions. Sure. Popi Mraki. Yeah. You've got your hand up. Oh. He doesn't know that he's got his hand up. Norampero, is that the hand up or not? Cleopatra, is that the Cleopatra I know? That's Cleopatra Magudman. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think this was a fruitful uh, dis uh, discussion on contraception. I made it specially for this women's want to challenge women. Women are not playing their part. With all that, I want to say thank you very much. Enjoy your rest of the day. The next month we are going to, the next three months, I promised throughout the year that I'm going to repeat the webinar that you requested me to repeat. There are three of them. It's pelvic organ prolapse. It's endometriosis. Laparoscopically. I'm going to repeat. I don't know which one will I repeat, which one first. But I'm going to, the, the next three Months will be repeat, and uh, just to satisfy those who emailed me and said I must repeat them. Thank you very much. I'm logging off. Good night. Thank you.